so this is based on joint work with uh, several author collaborators that are listed here as well. Uh, so I'll be talking about common information and how that plays a role in security and privacy problems. Uh, so specifically, I'll talk about three uh, different problems. Uh, first, in uh, two-party computation, we can ask uh, which primitives are complete, that is, they allow any general co secure computation to be performed. In secure two-party sampling, which is a special case of computation, we can ask which distributions can be uh, securely sampled from scratch, that is, using only error-free communication. Uh, and then in a third problem that's a bit different than the other two, we can look at uh, when we want to do privacy-preserving data release and you have a privacy utility trade-offs, uh, you can ask when is uh, output perturbation, which is a class of release, mechanism, release mechanisms, when are those uh, optimal versus uh, strictly suboptimal? And even though these are three very different problems, um, it turns out that common information plays a key role in characterizing, answering these problems, and uh, deriving some simple proofs about these results. So to begin with, I'll give a brief review of common information, which was introduced in two different forms uh, by Gatch Corner and by Weiner. Uh, and there was a, a lot of attention uh, in the 70s on deriving their results and related properties. OK, so first, uh, Gatch Corner introduced this notion of common information. Uh, that you can motivate operationally by this coding problem. Uh, here you have x and y that are just drawn ID from some joint distribution. You have these sequences. And the first decoder has as input the x sequence, and the second decoder has as input the y sequence. And the decoders are trying to produce a common random variable. I mean, they want to try to produce w1 and w2 that are equal with high probability. And the common info is basically the idea is, what's the maximum common, common randomness that you can independently extract from x and from y? Uh, so this definition of common info is sort of like saying, what's the max entropy rate that you can extract in this type of coding problem? So it turns out, as characterized by Gash and Corner, that this uh, common info uh, quantity is equal to a single letter, single letter characterization of it, basically like a single letter version of this problem, uh, which is sort of saying, what's the maximum entropy random variable w that is both a function of x and both a function of y? And this maximum actually has a specific form, and it actually just boils down to the entropy of the common part. And we saw a bit of this yesterday in the talks in the morning explaining this. And this common part, which I'll define soon, the entropy of this is always less than mutual info. So what is the common part of x and y? Uh, again, this was talked about in yesterday morning's uh, talks as well. But if you have a graph to represent the joint distribution of x and y, you place an edge whenever the joint probability is positive, uh, you'll have one or more connected components in this graph. And basically, the common part, w, w star here, is just the index of the connected component that contains the realization of x and y. Uh, so this common part is uh, clearly going to be a deterministic function of x and a deterministic function of y. Throughout this talk, when I use little f and little g, I just mean that it's some deterministic function. And it turns out that common info is just the entropy of this common part random variable, the gatch corner common info. So we also have another definition of common information introduced by Weiner. Uh, and they can be motivated operationally by this sort of different uh, coding problem. And you've sort of flipped the order of things here. Now instead of having inputs to these decoders being uh, these sequences, you're trying to construct sequences x and y according to some joint distribution. And uh, really the question is, so each decoder gets the same n times r random bits. And really the, the concept of Weiner common information is, what's the minimum amount of common randomness necessary to independently reconstruct these sequences x and y uh, such that you know, asymptotically they're basically like IID samples of the target distribution. What's the minimal rate of information you need to be able to reconstruct these sequences x and y? So Weiner showed that uh, this quantity is equal to a single letter characterization uh, that boils down to an optimization problem. There's no simple closed form expression except to say that it's an the solution of this optimization problem. Uh, which is finding the uh, a random variable w that minimizes this mutual info between w and x comma y, subject to w making x and y conditionally independent. Uh, 
And he shows that this minimum exists, and you can do this with a cardinality bound on W. And this quantity turns out to be always greater than uh, mutual information. Uh, OK, so you can compare uh, a Weiner and Gatch corner conceptually. I think we saw a very similar figure in yesterday morning's talk. Uh, Weiner is like saying, OK, you have x and y. These circles represent the entropy of x and entropy of y, respectively. The intersection here is the mutual information. Weiner is sort of like saying, well, we're finding a random variable, w, the smallest random variable that covers x and y. And the Weiner common info is just this uh, red region, both red regions, the, the overlap with x and y. And uh, Gatch Corner is sort of saying, well, we're finding the largest w here that lives entirely within the mutual info. So that's like a Venn diagram analogy of what these quantities mean. Um, and there's also other operational uh, definitions of these quantities that follow from this coding problem introduced by Gray and Weiner. Uh, here you have sequences x and y going into an encoder. And the encoder produces three messages. Uh, the first two messages goes to decoder 1, which is trying to reproduce the x sequence. And the second two messages goes into decoder 2, which is trying to reproduce the y sequence. Uh, you can define a rate region of achievable rates that you need for these messages in order to reproduce the sequences with high probability. And Weiner common info. So, so RX is a function of X alone, and uh, RY is a function of Y. Is that uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it means which decoder goes to. So, all messages are a function of both sequences. In fact, there's actually another uh, generalization. You can even you could actually split this up into three separate encoders and only see parts of the sequences. But it's equivalent in terms of the rate region. But yeah, the, the messages can all depend on all the sequences. They're labeled differently because Rx only goes to the coder 1, Ry only goes to the coder 2, and Rc is a common message that goes to both the coders. Uh, so Weiner common info is also equivalent to basically the minimum common rate that you need while coding efficiently. So while ensure, encoding efficiently in the sense that the total sum rate is no larger than the joint entropy. Right, so that's the minimum common rate you need in this sense of coding efficiently. And it also turns out that uh, Gatch corner common info can also falls out of this, uh, this larger region. It's basically the maximum common rate that you can have in this common message while coding efficiently in a different sense. Here, this means that the rate going into the coder 1 is no larger than the entropy of x, and the rate going to the coder 2 is no larger than the entropy of y. So this is just to justify, just to say that there's other sort of operational significances for Weiner and Gatch corner common information as well. But we're really just going to be interested in these quantities. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Gatch corner common information is upper bounded by mutual information which is then a lower bound on uh, Weiner common info. And it turns out that equality is met in both of these bounds, uh, is met in one of these bounds if and only if it's met in the other bound. Uh, so c common info is equal to mutual information if and only if the other notion of common info is equal to mutual information. And then there's all these other conditions that are equivalent to this binary property, uh, such as the common part making x and y uh, conditionally independent, uh, such as x and y being decompo decomposable into three random variables of this form, where there is some common random variable that makes the remaining parts independent. Uh, and you can even state it directly in terms of a property of the joint distribution. This is basically saying that if you look at this joint distribution within each connected component of the graph, you can sort of factorize the distribution. Uh, and a simple example of a case when common info is equal to mutual information is when either x is a function of y or when y is a function of x. But there's more general situations as well. So this property, uh, you know, this lemma means that you have this binary property. Either common info is equal to mutual info or it's not equal in either sense of common info. And this is the binary property that plays a really big role in all of these characterizations and proofs that I'll talk about. Uh, another thing that's very useful to make in order to make statistical, you know, sort of epsilon security proofs is to have continuity of this gap, if anything. Uh, however, as also discussed uh, in yesterday morning's talks, uh, Gatch corner common info is not continuous with respect to the joint distribution of x and y. Uh, 
And this is very similar to an example given yesterday morning. Basically, you can change the joint distribution just slightly, add an epsilon edge, and common information, gauge corner common info, can jump discreetly, go from 1 to 0 here in this case. On the other hand, Weiner common information is uniform. Uh, I mean, sorry, is, is continuous uh, with respect to the uh, joint distribution, and, and uniformly continuous as well. Uh, so that makes Weiner common info quite useful for statistical security uh, proofs. OK. So with that, I'll start talking about the problems. And the first problem uh, that I'll talk about is secure computation, secure two-party computation, uh, where the parties, Alice and Bob, want to compute some desired function. So Alice has input Q, Bob has input T, and they want to compute this functionality that's given by this uh, conditional distribution. So it's potentially a randomized computation. And they want to do this uh, via an interactive protocol. Uh, and the protocol can use local computation, error-free message passing, and it can use some given set of primitives, meaning it basically has another set of functionalities available in order to do that it can use. Uh, so the idea is using this protocol, we try to realize this computation. And privacy, which I'll detail in, in a more thorough sense later, means that basically the protocol should ensure that Alice only gets her output and Bob only gets, learns his, his desired output and so on. Um, and we're primarily focused on this feasibility question, how and when uh, secure computation be performed, and particularly uh, the question of completeness. You know, which primitives here allow you to compute any functions here? So really, if you think about secure computation, it's like saying, given one set of functionalities, can we compute other functionalities? Uh, and for this first part of the talk, we'll focus on the passive, semi-honest security case. But later, we'll talk a bit about the active security case as well. Um, so in terms of fe feasibility, there has been a bunch of past work. It's well known that if you're in the from scratch scenario, that you only have error-free computation, er error-free message passing available, and no other primitives, a bunch of functions you, you can't do, you can't securely compute, um, such as and, or, oblivious transfer, so on. Uh, it turns out there that there are known examples of complete primitives. For example, as discussed in yesterday morning's talk, if you have this thing called oblivious transfer, uh, where you can basically then compute anything. It's a complete primitive. And oblivious transfer is basically... Right, okay, sorry. It, this. Right, of course, yeah. So that's not quite the right reference if you want to look at the passive case, yes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's known even earlier. Um, so oblivious transfer is an example of a complete primitive. Um, in specific subclasses of primitives, there have been uh, a string of results characterizing which primitives are complete and which are incomplete. Uh, Killian looked at the case where the primitive has only one party gets an output. He also looked at the case where both parties get the same output. Uh, Nasser, Mento, and Winter looked at the case where you have, where the primitive is essentially a source, that there's no inputs, but uh, the parties get outputs that are just jointly distributed according to some source. And more recently, uh, the uh, completeness for general primitives was shown in this work here. Uh, and what we really want to talk about today is basically showing how uh, these General completeness can be characterized and proven quite simply using common information as a tool. Okay, so in order to think about security and protocols, let's think about what we mean by a protocol first, in, in the first sense. Uh, so a useful way to model a protocol is to consider it as like a sequence of views for Alice and for Bob. So at the first stage of the protocol, the first view, R0, Alice's view is just her input. Bob's view is just his input. And in each round, the views can only grow. They go from round t to t plus 1. And this can only change in one of three ways. Uh, the parties can perform local computation. Uh, this just means that they can do possibly randomized local computation independently of the other party. Uh, they can pass, ma pa pass messages. So basically, they can derive a message that's just a function of their view and send it to the other party. And they could you know, do this simultaneously if they want. Or they can use a primitive, meaning they can 
generate inputs for a primitive according to their views, feed them into a primitive, get outputs, and that gets added to their view. So in each one of these steps, their views only grow since you can't sort of unsee something. And at the end of n rounds, you have these final views, and you just produce outputs as functions of your final views. And without loss of generality, this captures you know, all those sort of protocols that we're interested in. And this makes it convenient for various proofs. So security, we can formulate in a statistical uh, sense. Uh, so epsilon delta security. So epsilon correctness here basically means that the distribution of the outputs should be close to the desired distribution that we wanted according to the functionality. This d here, we just mean, by that we just mean total variational distance. And we consider the worst case overall possible input distributions. And this distance should be less than epsilon. For privacy, being almost private, we basically want these Markov chains to almost hold. So looking at the first Markov chain, this means the final view of Alice uh, should be conditionally independent of Bob's input and Bob's output, given Alice's input and output. Uh, and you know, if we want this in a sort of a delta sense, we can replace these Markov chains with uh, conditional mutual information, which is a way to capture almost Markovity. And again, we do worst case overall input distributions, and we want this to be less than delta. Uh, and we want you know, these things to be vanishing. So we say that a functionality is securely computable it, you know, for, for a given set of primitives using, you know, that, that the protocol can use if there exists an epsilon delta protocol for any epsilon and delta vanishing. And a primitive is complete if all functionalities can be securely computed using that primitive. Okay. So before we go up, yeah. Yeah, Rn and Sn are the final views of Alice. So Rn is the view of Alice at the end of the protocol, and S is the view of Bob. Uh, right. Yeah, the views would be di yeah the views would be different. Yeah, because they can each do local computation separately. Primitives give them different views. All sorts of things can give them different views. I'm sorry? Um, so what's a condition on extent of Q? What's a condition on my input? Yeah. My view is... Uh, in, independent of the other party's view and... Uh, sorry, independent of the other party's input and output. Okay. Yeah. So Alice's view is... Yeah, Alice's view doesn't reveal anything more about the other party's okay. input and output than, than her own, than what's already revealed by her own input and output. Oh, so we don't we haven't even used common info yet. That comes up in the characterization. So this, uh, yeah, if you if you want to, uh, to have perfect security, you'd want these Markov chains to hold exactly. But one way to sort of weaken these Markov chains in an epsilon sense is to use um, uh, is to use conditional mutual info. Uh, so, I mean, is this formulation problematic? Well, well, one, for security, we want this to be vanishing. So as it's vanishing, it means that you want this to sort of go to these Markov chains. It's actually not problematic. There's, um, you know, so this is a bit different than the formulations like real versus ideal paradigm that you see in the CS literature. There's this interesting paper by Kripal, uh, Kripo and other authors that show how you can use these information theoretic conditions to characterize security instead. Well, yeah, with, but with mutual information going to zero, you'll also have like, these statistical distances going to zero, I think. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to require that this holds for any epsilon and delta. So you can have this vanishing exponentially if you want to. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it should. It should no, 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 no. We're not thinking about delta being constants. We just means that you know, like you can have a sequence of protocols where you can make this vanish as fast as you want to. And there's no reference to efficiency here. Yeah. Okay. There's no efficiency, but it's not clear until vanishes exponentially. So, so, so there, there, there's there's a, there's a series of papers that actually talk about how these can work out. Uh, that these are basically equivalent to. Uh, it, like the CS type real versus idea world paradigm. Um, so this is really just equivalent to, to those. Uh, it's a statistical security type guarantee. OK. So, so secure sampling is a special case of the computation problem uh, where basically there are no inputs uh, to the functionality that you want to compute. So essentially, it means that you want to securely generate outputs with some desired distribution. And in that case, the security conditions simplify in a way. Uh, and then this becomes a useful case to consider also when, when considering proofs for completeness as well. Um, first of all, we know that in this simplified problem, um, a distribution can be securely sampled in the from scratch using just error-free messages if and only if the distribution uh, has that common info is equal to mutual information. So this is the first case that common info and mutual uh, common info shows up. So basically, we'll call a distribution trivial in this sense if common info is equal to mutual information. Uh, and we'll also say that a set of primitives is useless for sampling if only trivial distributions can be securely sampled using that set because it doesn't give you anything more than just using error-free uh, communication. So with that, uh, we can say, talk about completeness of general two-party primitives now. Uh, basically, a general primitive is complete if, when using uniform inputs, uh, the joint distribution between Alice's input and Alice's output and Bob's input and Bob's output uh, is, has that common info is greater than mutual info. So basically, if you're, using, if you're using this primitive of uniform inputs, if it produces a non-trivial distribution, it's complete. Uh, and this characterization was first provided in this reference, however, not stated explicitly in this form, but in an, in an equivalent way. And what we show in, in, in our work is actually that you can state it in this form, and you can actually use common info to prove this characterization. Uh, so first, in terms of achievability of this result, why is this why are these primitives complete? Um, basically, what this means is that if you use these, this, this primitive with uniform inputs, you're basically simulating a non-trivial source between AU and BV. And we know from Nasty Month and Winter that non-trivial sources are complete. So that can wrap up achievability quite easily. And with, uh, with for converse, uh, we can prove this converse using common information. And really, we can actually prove the strong result in, result in this further statement that basically that any set of incomplete primitives is useless for sampling. So we show that any, given any set of primitives that do not meet these conditions, you can only securely sample uh, trivial distributions. And hence, you can't do any general computation. Is the, is the definition of non-trivial sources different than the definition of common information definition? Or what does it mean for sources to be non-trivial? Yeah, non-trivial just means that common info is, e is not equal to mutual info. So yeah, and, and, and yeah, it's this. It means that common inf because Weiner common info is always greater than or equal to mutual info. So, so yeah, it follows. It would follow from this just by realizing that you can use uh, uniform inputs to the primitive, and hence you basically get a source that's non-trivial. So so the positive side follows, you know, just using that realization. The negative side is saying that if all the primitives result in common info equal to mutual info, we can show actually a, somewhat of a strong result that only trivial distributions can be securely sampled. And hence, you can't do general computation either. Uh, and then this converse technique is you know, very, very related to this monotone converse method looked at in the literature. And there's this tension region extension that was talked about in the talk uh, yesterday morning as well. Uh, so let's talk about how this converse works. So the way we can think about this is we'll consider the secure sampling problem. And the initial views in a secure sampling problem 
are just constants. So common info equals mutual information equals zero. They're, they're trivial views to begin with. And we want to argue that given trivial views at, at round t, you'll have trivial views at round t plus one. Um, and it's, it's fairly straightforward to show that local computation and message passing will preserve triviality. And this follows from past work in the literature. And what you have to show, the, the remaining thing to show is to show that using an incomplete primitive you will preserve triviality as well. So starting with trivial views uh, and you know, using the primitive, you result in trivial views. And you know, by this uh, sort of uh, recursive argument, uh, you have inductive argument, you have that the final views are trivial as well. So let's go back to this lemma of why uh, uh, incomplete primitive will, result, will preserve triviality. Uh, so this is just a restatement of it up here. So you can actually show this lemma just by proving, the, proving it in, uh, by showing it in these steps. The first step is basically the conditions for an incomplete primitive. Uniform inputs results in this trivial situation. And you can prove that if this holds, if one holds, then any independent inputs also results in a trivial situation. Any inputs that are independent given some z results in this trivial situation where z is now available on both sides. And then from this, you can show that starting from any trivial uh, views and any inputs generated from those trivial views, you'll preserve triviality as well. Um, the other direction follows immediately, but you can show that these equivalent conditions are equivalent. So hence, incomplete primitives preserve triviality. So then with these things, you have that the final views are trivial. Uh, but now, you know, you're not just outputting the final views, you're outputting some outputs that are generated as functions of these finite views. And that's where triviality might break if you do that. Uh, but we have this lemma that basically says that if you start from trivial views and then you generate outputs that satisfy the privacy conditions for secure sampling within some delta, like these conditional material informations are within some delta, then triviality can only break by some delta gap. Yes? Well, so, so yeah, the difference there with local computation is that you keep, you keep the view, the view only grows, but when you, when you make this output here, uh, it, it is true that x hat comma rn it, it it and y hat comma sn is trivial, but then you have to ask the question about what about between just x hat and y hat? Oh, so like you, you yeah, there's a processing that reduces the size, you know, to get an output, you're reducing the size of the view. Yeah, if you kept the rest of the view, then, then it would still be trivial. But this final output stage, if you're looking at just the outputs, that's smaller than the whole view. So once you narrow down, if you try to unsee something, uh, that's where you could potentially break triviality. But if, you're, if you have this delta privacy, that means that the gap between mutual info and common info can't grow by larger than delta. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I mean, suppose you have, you have, yeah, if you have like A B on one side and A B on one side, if this side just reduces down to A and this side reduces down to B, you can now have some sort of non-trivial correlation, uh, right? Okay, so you have this lemma that says that if you're delta private, you'll only grow this by delta. And you know, the requirement for securely sampling means that this has to hold for all epsilon and delta. So that means that for any distribution x and y you want to sample, you have a protocol that produces x hat and y hat that's close in distribution to x and y, and also has that this common info, mutual information gap is less than delta. And then the final step is just to use continuity of one or common info to argue that this implies that the common info of the actual x and y is equal to the mutual info of the actual x and y. So the last step is just to take care of this uh, gap using continuity. And that's it. So hence, you can only sample trivial distributions given incomplete uh, primitives. So is there an application factor? I mean, can you achieve a small number of that achieves a bigger gap between the privacy? Um, 
Well, uh, so I mean, the definition of being able to securely sample something means that you need to drive the epsilon and delta to zero. You need to show that you can, that you can. No, no, so this is not even, this isn't even a case where we're considering multiple copies. We're just considering a single shot here, like a single X and a single Y that you're dealing with. Um, and the only asymptotic is that you can consider like a sequence of protocols that approaches perfect security rather than just having one protocol that is perfectly secure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're not we're not even considering about rate and efficiency. We're just asking the the basic feasibility question, and you know which primitives are complete. But in general, you could also worry about efficiency as well, and how many times you need to use this primitive for generating how many copies of the. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You can do that as well. Um, so right, so, so I mean a picture of, of this whole thing is that you, know, you, can, you can say that sources are either trivial or non-trivial uh, based on this common info property. Uh, you can also characterize primitives as being complete or incomplete as this property. And just to recap, a complete primitive will allow you to basically securely sample all the sources as well as doing all secure computation. Uh, if you don't have any primitives available, you're just in this uh, error-free message passing, you can only sample the trivial distributions. But even if you have all incomplete primitives available, you can still only securely sample just the trivial distributions. Just, uh, to add to that picture, you could also draw a trivial for the primitives. Yeah, you could. Yes, and we will in the next slide, actually. But yeah, so there's also a trivial set in the primitives, but that's less well understood. Uh, so I mean, completeness. Yeah, but for the randomized functions, it's not understood. Yeah, so. How about if you only get so if you only get about uh, the, the function the function that you want to compute like if you only want to compute a dense subset of them by continuity arguments, does this go through? Or, like instead of getting all possible p of uh, uh, u d given a d, you only wanted to get a dense subset of them. No, they're quantitatively different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't think. Yeah. Even in the single, if you're trying to get a single letter version of a complete primitive, you're given any number of copies of the complete primitive, you cannot do that. You'll be very far from that. Like the primitive you get, what are you doing to them will be very far from the complete. Maybe the positive version of six question is are there, uh, is there, is it, so you're saying you can't get every non-trivial distribution, but you're also saying you can, so you can for any non-trivial joint distribution you can't get, you can't achieve it. For even one, right? You're saying you can't get all of them, yeah, but you, can't, you, can't, you can't even get one of them. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you can't even get one, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so completeness is fairly well understood in the general case, but it turns out that triviality for general primitives isn't well understood. There are you know, subclasses where it is understood and you either have trivial or completeness. But for general primitives and functions, um, it's unclear uh, where, where this fully trivial subset is. Uh, so there's this open question there. OK. Since I might be a little bit tight on time, I'm just going to go a bit fast over some of the rest of the stuff. Um, Basically, we can look at secure sampling for malicious parties as well. Um, and I'll just, you can formulate this in a real versus ideal paradigm. This is the reference, by the way, uh, that shows that these, these uh, mutual, like these information theoretic conditions are equivalent to a picture like this. 
this. Yes, there's a follow-up work in 08 where they do the statistical security as well. So this is the perfect security, and then these are the perfect security conditions. And this is specialized for secure sampling as well. But you can also formulate it with statistical security. And basically, they show that you can sort of turn statistical guarantees in this real versus idea paradigm into sort of these epsilon mutual informations. One comment there is that what they show is what's called standalone security. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. There's, there's, that, uh, there's that detail as well. This is standalone active security. Um, now, there's some well-known results in the impossibility of coin flipping. I won't go over that too many, in too many details because uh, I want to just get to the key points. Uh, so basically, the, the, the key point that I want to make here is, is that if you wanted to flip coins and the parties are talking sequentially, it's impossible. But if you're talking simultaneously, it's very easy. Each party just semi simultaneously reveals a random bit. You declare heads if they're both equal. Or you call it tails if they're not equal. It's just basically playing odds or evens. So there's a big difference between talking simultaneously versus talking sequentially when you have active security. And there's these impossibility results in the literature. Um, so this, uh, this also matters for general secure sampling. So it turns out that it's actually impossible, to, speaking sequentially, it's impossible to sample any correlated randomness. You have to have that the distributions, distributions are independent. Um, and if you have speaking simultaneously, you can actually sample all of the, all of the trivial, distribution, tr trivial distributions that you can sample with passive security as well. And actually using common info, these things are very easy to prove. And I'll just skip over these for the sake of time in order to get to the final part of the talk. I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You use coin flips to simulate the common part, and then you can generate the x and y from the common part independently if you see the common part. That's the achievability scheme. If you want to do this in a multi layer setting, you know, in copies or something like that, are there any resolvability in those sort of kind of, you know, well, I think you could maybe just do sample and copies of the common part in that case, if you wanted to do it in a multi-letter setting. So for the achievability point of view. OK. And you know, there's some interesting things you can do with secure sampling to play games that I'll just skip over for the sake of time. I want to get to this last part of the talk, since it's a bit different. Um, so uh, in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about uh, privacy-preserving uh, data release. So you have some sort of mechanism. You want to release data. Uh, and a general question to ask is, how can you release some useful data while also preserving privacy? This can be motivated by you know, maybe you have medical data, which has some research utility to release to the public. But you don't want to compromise patient privacy. Uh, we know that this is quite challenging in general. There's you know, widely cited and notable cases where people trying to release anonymized data ended up ruining people's privacy. And there's a lot of talk, you know, work, in the work on this issue. We'll see some talks tomorrow about differential privacy, of course. Uh, that's one way to sort of approach these challenges. Um, in this talk, we're going to focus on an information theoretic treatment of this problem um, that looks at privacy utility trade-offs explicitly. Um, that was introduced recently in the literature. And it has some strong connections to rate distortion theory. Um, and you know, within this framework, if you look at privacy utility trade-offs when you have limited data, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, it, you can look at the impact of, of when you have limited data on the privacy utility trade-offs, I mean. Uh, and specifically, I'll talk about the conditions for the general optimality of output perturbation versus when output perturbation is strictly suboptimal. So th the formulation of the problem looks something like this. Uh, you have some sensitive data x, some useful data y, uh, and you have some model that describes how they're related. Uh, you make an observation of that data, and that goes into a mechanism that generates some release z. And the idea is that you have these competing goals. One, you want to minimize privacy leakage, uh, which is in, in t quantified in the terms of the mutual information between x and z. You want to make that as small as possible. At the same time, you want to minimize some distortion metric which is some functional of the joint distribution between the useful data and the release data. 
And this implies a privacy utility trade-off if X and Y are correlated, and there's very strong connections to rate distortion theory. Um, and you can think about uh, the sort of optimal trade-off between privacy and utility. So for some distortion budget delta, what's the best privacy you can get over all mechanisms that you can optimize for here? In this part of the talk, I'll really just focus on two cases um, in order to talk about the difference between full data and output perturbation. So in a full data case is where the observation is just all of the data. So you have a mechanism that has access to both X and Y and is trying to produce its output, its release. In an output perturbation, you're considering a case where the output, where the mechanism only uses as input the useful data. Either X is unavailable, maybe, or maybe you're just intentionally ignoring it. Uh, and we're interested in, interested in saying is how does the unavailability, unavailability of the sensitive data affect the privacy utility trade-offs? Now clearly the trade-offs here can only be worse than the full data case. But you know, are they ever equal? When is output perturbation optimal? So when, 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 is, when are the trade-offs actually equal? Now of course you can always pick some trivial distortion metrics or some trivial distortion budget uh, where the trade-offs will be equal. Um, but are there any cases where there's general equality of these, uh, of these trade-offs uh, for any distortion metric and any distortion budget? Really, what data models lead to general output perturbation optimality? And what we show is that if the distribution between X and Y is trivial, that is, if common info is equal to mutual info, then for any uh, distortion metric and any delta, you have that the output perturbation mechanisms achieve the same trade-offs as the full data mechanisms. So for example, in cases where, say, the useful data is just the function of your sensitive data, you have that output perturbation is optimal, and vice versa if x is a function of, of y. But sort of conversely, if you have that the data model has that common info not equal to mutual info, uh, then there will exist some distortion metric where at some delta, you have a strict optimality in your trade-off. So let's talk about um, how that works. So first we can prove the sufficient conditions. So the idea, it turns out that when common info is equal to mutual information, the best full data mechanism really only depends on y and the common part. And the common part is just a function of, of y anyway. So it really only depends on y. And intuitively, uh, you know, in the details of the proof, uh, you can see that essentially for any full data mechanism that has access to both x and y, you can create an output perturbation mechanism that first uh, synthetically generates, this simulates this synthetic sensitive data, and then that, that synthetic sensitive data and the useful data get fed into uh, the full data mechanism to generate an output. And it turns out that you can show that, the, well, because this is only using synthetic sensitive data, the privacy of this mechanism can only be better than the full data mechanism. And they will still achieve the same distortion because the joint distribution between the useful data and the release is the same in both cases. Now this almost intuitively kind of makes sense for general distributions between X and Y. But it turns out that we have to use the fact that common info equals the mutual info to, pro to prove this fact. Uh, and hence, because of this, this trick, the ability to simulate the synthetic data, sim simulate the sen sensitive data, and then feed it into the full data mechanism, this implies that the output perturbation mechanism will have the same trade-offs, privacy utility trade-offs, as the full data mechanism. However, it turns out that you can't make this type of argument when you have that common info is not equal to mutual info. And this is actually a consequence of this lemma. And this lemma is just a general general statement about uh, distributions that are non-trivial. Uh, and we call this Markovity can increase mutual info. So basically, so you have a, non, so you have a non-trivial distribution. Basically, you can find a Z in a Z prime uh, with the constraint that, Z, that, that, that the joint distributions between Y and Z and between Y and Z prime are the same, except that Z prime has to satisfy this Markov chain, whereas Z can depend on both X and Y. Now you can construct these z and z primes such that the mutual info between x and z is zero, 
but the mutual info between x and z prime is strictly greater than zero. And in a sort of uh, analogous sense, what that sort of means is that, you know, for some x and y that are, that are non-trivial, there exists a z that depends on both x and y that has that, you know, that has perfect privacy, that mutual info is equal to zero. But if, in, but if you try to s s simulate the sensitive data and then feed that into the full data mechanism uh, and use it this way, you'll end up with a z prime that actually has non-perfect privacy. So you know, maybe these types of implications have, I mean, this has broader philosophical implications as well, because in a lot of other privacy mechanisms, you see the trick of re-simulating sensitive information. So at least in this type of privacy framework, you can actually uh, suffer as a result of that. And basically, as a consequence of, of this existence, you can kind of construct an example with a distortion metric and distortion threshold, where the output perturbation mechanism has one trade-off that's strictly larger than the full data mechanism's privacy utility trade-off. So yeah, to summarize, I guess I went faster than I thought. Uh, to summarize, basically, uh, common info is a classic tool, but it's really useful in a lot of security and privacy problems. Yep, that's it.